Um, next speaker is Jason Preston, and he's speaking on why we can't do without, how do you say that? Um, butyl, butyl, rubber. Butyl, okay. butyl rubber on Mars and how to make it simplify safely, efficiently, purely from Martian materials. So everyone give them an applause. Thank you. All right. All right. Hey guys, thanks for coming in here. This is a engineering subject and a chemistry subject. Weren't my favorite subjects in school, um, but I got motivated a few years ago about this. Ended up partnering with a guy I need to give plenty of credit to, a young man, 10 years my junior, named Jonathan Yancey. He's a chemist who had done an internship with NASA on life support chemistry when I found him. And he helped me make sure that the chemistry that I show you today is actually legitimate enough to uh, withstand at least one round of scrutiny. I'm sure there's ways to fine tune this. But yeah, first, why the heck butyl rubber? I had not heard of this before I became fascinated with building a colony that withstood the scrutiny of my own imagination. And I realized that a lot of the building materials talked about by Kim Stanley Robinson and other geniuses like uh, Bob Zubrin, they were great and they had a lot of merit. And I didn't want to build something without them, like the bricks, for instance. But I did realize that each of them had a catastrophic weakness that needed to be complemented by some other material in the structure. And it needed to be a material that was also buildable on Mars. Uh, so some of these weak points with metal, um, if it rips in your habitat, it fits what's holding your air in. You're going to need equipment and energy and temperatures and skills that are really hard to come by in an emergency. You, you know, how many times are you standing near a rip in your house when you have a really skilled welder, like the right arc welding tool, it's fired up and it's got enough juice to it and it's okay to like blast a thousand degrees of temperature in this space because there is no oxygen tank here or live wire there. And good, good luck trying to get like a spot weld to stick when you've got 15 pounds a square inch of you know, air pushing through the hole. So metal, scary if it's the only thing between you and death. Glass. It can start to crack. You can try to put tape on it. The crack can keep growing anyway, especially under that pressure, or it can fail catastrophically. Brickwork, unproven against high PSI differentials. I've never seen somebody build an igloo and then like, you know, pump it empty and see if it collapses. Um, I don't trust masonry also to hold against slow leakage because concrete doesn't. When they built Biosphere 2, they started like suffocating and they noticed that the, the environment wasn't uh, self-sustaining and it was losing CO2 because the concrete turns out it's not airtight. Concrete drinks carbon dioxide hungrily. So I don't want to be inside something that needs to be airtight on Mars when every molecule and mole of gas is crucial to my survival and I don't know how much my structure leaks it. Um, sealed tunnels. Say we go in and like blast an existing tunnel or a new one and just melt it, just molten. Now it's like airtight. But now if there's a repair needed, we can only access it from the interior. I see that as a weakness. And also it, it, the exterior is, has unknown flaws because it's on mother nature. And then earth scent inflatables. Lovely idea, not going to be useful for in situ resource utilization, long term, complete autarky from Earth because these are materials that are infinitely complex. They're the last thing that we'll be able to make on Mars. They have 19 components, complicated weaves and processes made them. And so I don't trust that like we're going to be able to build from them long term on Mars before we need to find some alternative in the meantime. Butyl rubber is also superior to other polymers. Um, I started realizing we need something kind of rubbery. Uh, it can uh, serve the, the purpose of being uh, you know, a somewhat rubbery membrane. Uh, it can also be used in liquid, as liquid sealant for those solids. Um, so in certain conditions, you can actually like have, you know, your liquid uh, isobutylene that um, is a good patch for a rip in it. And unlike arc welding or metal rip, this actually like, you know, spot reacts. Um, part of the curing process in creating the solid is at extreme low temperatures. And so Mars is gonna provide every time there's a rip the perfect environment to turn a liquid sealant into a solid the instant that it hits the gap. Um, and also for pipes that blow and gaskets. Great material for that too. It's made of only two elements, carbon and hydrogen. So we're not worried about chasing after rare elements in its manufacture. It's um, one of the only truly airtight rubbers. So it won't leak like Biosphere did. It has a tremendous R value to hold in uh, heat 
at workable thicknesses, because everything can eventually be an insulator if you can make it thick enough. Uh, but this stuff can hold, uh, you know, hold your heat in against uh, Martian ambient temperatures at like 10 centimeters. It's a workable slab, especially in Martian gravity. It's an electrical insulator, super useful when you're living in uh, metal tubes that have uh, electrical wiring and, and water tubes uh, and human exhalation and electrostatically conductive uh, iron oxide in the air and so on. Um, do you want to be able to like put walls around your electrical stuff? Um, relatively flexible at low temperatures, so it's not like it's going to shatter when you put it next to the ambient temperatures. And it could withstand a 15 pounds per square inch pressure differential at the right kind of strength level, um, you know, like a car tire kind of strength level. So it doesn't bulge too much, it doesn't uh, resist inflation too much. Other merits, it can be cut or molded to spec easily, possibly spray applied in multiple layers on uneven surfaces. Um, it is an inner layer of habitat. It can expand and contract globally to bear the strain of flux in the habitat's air temperature and air pressure. Otherwise, you have to build a lung into your complex. And a lung is you know, a highly localized and specialized piece of a complex and functions variably well depending on where the problem uh, or originates relative to the lung in the system. This uh, system I'm about to show you at the end uh, does not have that problem. Um, it can bear the weight, uh, bear its own weight when you inflate it, um, so it won't sag and uh, even uh, withstand some ca cave-ins of regolith above it due to the virtues of low Martian gravity. Uh, so you could have the rock um, break through uh, a stronger material overhead and uh, the inflated chamber would still not crush you. It would just give you a nice indication that you had a problem to fix um, because the ceiling was a little lower. It's a fairly plausible, and we'll talk about telltale butyl rubber walls as a, as a universally simple, almost fail-proof, mechanism-free, uh, electronics-free uh, sensor. Um, it's almost like an idiot-proof way of uh, making sure that your colony is telling you about failures without having to trust that the sensors themselves are, are not failing or the uh, sensor relays are not failing. Okay, so that's a merit we need to get to. First, we also need to say, this is a fairly plausible component of a locally made suit. So Earth suits have the same problem as inflatables. They're made out of 19 different materials and it takes our greatest uh, textile geniuses to make them. Um, and we're, there's some indication we could get something working with just this extremely simple uh, material that's part way to a suit. It can be made in just nine steps on Mars. It could be made in fewer steps on Earth, probably, from petroleum. Uh, but that's not bad, considering that all the other uh, steps on the way produce useful byproducts, and we'll see what those are. Its production is in some ways easier on Mars than Earth, because some of the steps would be ex expedited by sub-zero temperatures, which on Earth you have to use energy to make. Uh, on Mars, just do the reaction outside. Turn off the thermostat for that reactor. Anoxic on Mars, just do it outside. Um, you don't have to pump the oxygen out to prevent an explosion. Uh, near vacuum, just open it up to vacuum pressures of the uh, ambient temperature, or ambient air. Finally, butyl rubber is super biologically inert. This is the last hurdle. A lot of rubbers, a lot of plastics, a lot of everything. If you just breathe it and live it and rub against it as a little worm in a tunnel for 60 years on Mars, you're gonna see some medical effects. Um, butyl rubber can be implanted in the body uh, at not very great purity levels, and the body won't even reject it, let alone uh, experience some sort of carcinogenic effect or other effect. So that's beautiful, right? Um, it's, it's just blessedly simple. And now what I want to do is uh, show you the overall process. These are nine reactions uh, in sequence. None of them use anything but local Mars materials, including solar power. And uh, there are um, research left to be done about how we uh, reduce each of these locally available elements to this form to feed into this process. Did um, you invent this process? Yancey and I did this together. And so I told him, here's what we need to get to. Here's the available ingredients on Mars. Help me work out the sequence of reactions that would be um, workable on Mars, um, what their reaction efficacies are, um, what the catalysts would be, or any sort of outside energy input. Um, and so this is legitimate uh, chemical engineering, at least to the first order of approximation. And I'd like to jump out of this presentation for a moment. Oh, okay. It's going to be a bit of a dance. 
So in this template I created, to, to, uh, it's an interactive Excel, Excel spreadsheet. You can set the selectivity of the reaction so that you're not presuming this works perfectly. Um, so you can presume it's really inefficient on Mars and adjust for that. You basically can um, specify inputs in kilograms of all the necessary inputs, um, including sucrose, uh, sodium, uh, carbon. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get back to my notes here. But you can make uh, specify all the inputs and it'll tell you how many outputs you get in kilograms. The one we're after is C4H8, and this is all, all these are fine-tuned with perfect reaction selectivity. Uh, and come up with one kilogram of butyl rubber. And in order to do that, this is what else you'll get in kilograms, this is what else you'll need, and, and then, of course, uh, unspecified amount of energy. Um, so then, we're gonna... So what's the process? So what's the process? The process? No, we have not done it, but these are all reactions that have already been done. These are all known reactions um, with, and, like, with names and such. I'm going to try to drag this back. Tell me when I have the bar. I need to be able to move this around. Move your cursor up a little bit. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So first, let's narrate what we can see here. These first two are well known to a lot of people that are Mars buffs. This is just hydrolysis or electrolysis of water. So you need water and electricity. You're going to get hydrogen and oxygen. That's fun as a byproduct. We like that. Then we take the hydrogen and we put it in a Sabatier reactor with abundant carbon dioxide, and we get out uh, methane and oxygen, and that's more oxygen that we love to uh, pump out. Tell me, um, am I on the bar with uh, the cursor? Yeah? yeah? I didn't drag. Yep. No. Yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, drag it. Ah, I did kind of get oh, up now. Down a little bit. Okay. Down a little bit. Uh -huh. All right. Oh, look at this. Uh-huh. Go further, further to the right, further to the right, further to the right, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Round a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> round, 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 round. All right. Okay, guys. So thank you. I'm, we're going to get through all this. This is going to be awesome. Okay. Okay. So now I'm maximizing my next run at showing you the rest of this, right? So we don't have to do this too many more times. In fact, I think we can get all of this except fermentation of sucrose onto the rest of the screen here. Um, you can just come around the front. Oh, you know, you're absolutely right. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little worried about how some of these things might tumble out as I, or wires or anchors might disconnect um, as I do this. So I'm kind of going to be timid about moving the laptop. Um, okay. Now we're gonna load up the next bit. Okay, keep going. Keep and it, going. of course, wants to make this small again. Too small, too small. All right. Okay, so now we got the rest. Now we've got our methane, hallelujah. And now we can actually um, use some of that oxygen in non-oxidative non coupling. Um, we're gonna get out uh, C2H6 in cases where I don't remember the, the colloquial name, I'm just gonna say that formula. And water? Ethane. Ethane. So then we get ethane, we chlorinate it. Then we chlorinate it with chlorine that's available in all of the perchlorates in the uh, soil and some more oxygen from earlier. And we're going to get out chloroethane and water. Water's nice to get out of this. Then we're going to hydrate, uh, help me out with your sulfur trioxide. Um, we're going to add some water to that. And we're going to get sulfuric acid. And that's a crucial one for later. And we uh, are able to like. Basically, use the sulfuric acid as a catalyst um, for the synthesis of um, acid ether. And what we're not seeing here, I'm not going to buy time or use up time by showing, is that we use microbes, almost you know, a million types, let's say yeast, to uh, ferment um, uh, sugar. Um, and we're going to be able to like use agriculturally derived sugars and agriculturally available yeast supplies to create ethanol. Which by itself is also awesome to have a little bit of <laughs> right? That takes the edge off. All, all the danger and freezing Mars warms you up, right? Russians would tell us that's the first most necessary ingredient on Mars. Okay, so now we're going to be able to take that ethanol, and uh, I think that's what we're looking at here is we're going to um, create ether from ethanol using sulfuric acid as a catalyst. What we get out of it is anybody want to tell me what this is? Because I have a note to tell myself what that is. C2H5, uh, dioxyl ether. ether. And then we're gonna like get also water out of that. 
And that's what we've been gunning for here. Because now we want to do a words reaction. We'll need dial ether right there. And we're also going to need fluoroethane. And in the words reaction, we just add some sodium on the soil. And gosh, we did run out of it. All right. Keep scrolling. <laughs> we're going to get N butane out of that. And then that leads us to the last step. There's a direct conversion of N butane. And I can just narrate what's not showing on there a little bit. We're going to drag it back. Right? Huh? I love this. Oh, I know. I'm using this for my being able to see what's going on here. All right. And the beauty of the last step is that um, so huh, the direct conversion of N-butane, actually, um, there's just, uh, I don't actually know what the specifics of that are, but we can all look it up when we get home. And it's basically an energetic reaction which allows it to break off some of the hydrogen and reduce it so that uh, H2 is broken off from each uh, molecule and you're left with isobutylene molecules. And then from there, it's just a matter of enchaining them um, you know, properly so that they form a butyl rubber uh, structure. Um, and of course, that's also gonna be this, the essential component in any sort of uh, sealant, liquid sealant, that you're gonna carry around to patch up that butyl rubber. So that's, um, that's the whole shebang, that's the whole process in a nutshell. And of course, uh, the beauty of it is that, you know, you're getting a lot of byproducts which are themselves um, truly lovely things to have lying around on Mars. And the main thing I'm trying to race to, and still have time for questions, is that I also have a design for a tunnel. Um, so there's lots of beautiful, fun ways to live on Mars where there's a better view than this. But this is a conservative, uh, like, modular structure which can be repeated indefinitely. And it's actually modeled off of, uh, you know, our, our, oh my gosh, again, right? All right, so we're going to basically try this button. All right, all right. Oh, it's a Preston tunnel. Why didn't you say so? All right, so, yeah, it's like, wait a minute, what do I call it? I'm just going to do that. My dad will be like, hey, you carried on the family name. Good job. But so the Preston tunnel cross section here reveals that this is essentially of similar dimensions to um, cargo containers. Cargo containers are universally available on Earth, and we engineer so many things to those dimensions. I think I tried to make these a little bit bigger, uh, just so this is a little bit more of a humane living space and accommodates equipment around the sides. Similar logic to what you see on the ISS, where any smaller diameter than this and the actual usable column in the middle is not very livable in the long term. All right, so what, what are we living in here? This is the cross section. You're not seeing any um, doors from one unit to another. We're not specifying how long or deep this is. But we're specifying a few really awesome killer apps. The yellow is the butyl rubber. In practice, this would have to be about 10 centimeters thick. And it would be inflated to a full 15 psi. The real killer app thing is the interaction of butyl rubber, a metallic outer layer, and then a pretty darn good vacuum as an interstice between the two. The vacuum is going to be a full, almost fail-safe, mechanics or mechanism-free, electronics-free, sensor-free uh, tool, so that the walls and the ceiling of our habitat tell us multiple things about what's happening that we need to monitor before they fail us completely. And uh, you know, systems theory says for every like uh, safety mechanism and sensor and guard you set up, those are more things that can fail on you. Most reactors blow up because one of the sensor mechanisms fails. All right, so we're gonna avoid that as much as we can and also ensure that we don't need to figure out how to make sensors on Mars immediately to build usable habitats with safety mechanisms. These butyl rubber walls inflate under 15 psi. Their thickness and their dimensions, I've calculated, will hold this shape if constructed properly. And you build them with slabs. You create these slabs, and then you weld them together at the, at the corners. Um, you slide them into the box and seal the box. You have joints that could be metal or could be rock or ceramic to prevent electrical bridging or other heating problems. Um, but you're mounting the corners, you're mounting the bottom, you leave a drainage gap and also a telltale interstice along the bottom as well. Um, gravel below in case the ambient heat heating of the uh, regolith is going to start creating like, you know, groundwater flows, liquid water flows, so that that doesn't create a structural problem later. So we're going to be able to have a drainage pipe in the gravel under all this. And then of course, we left ourselves 
a wider bore at the top of our um, ditch that we built. And we took the two slabs out at the top so that we could later lay them down evenly, lay, resting on these ledges. And that's about three meters of uh, regolith. And that's pretty much the minimum to protect you from the ambient radiation in the long term. So then there's a lot of features built in here that are super paranoid. My mom taught me to be paranoid. The Boy Scouts taught me. And that's what we're, worried, we're thinking about here. What if this metal fails? It rips. What we're going to be able to see in the vacuum is a very slight reduction of vacuum. So about 1% of an atmospheric pressure. Also, any uh, more advanced sensors we have will be able to say that this is not an oxygenated atmosphere. And so immediately we'll know which of the two layers broke. And we'll know, like, we don't have to worry about catching it before this entire space fills because that's not a catastrophic failure. The whole space will fill while we sleep. And when we wake up, the walls will bulge a tiny bit and we'll be able to detect that. And we'll be able to know from the tiny amount of bulging that it was the metal that failed. And then we go into the inner slice by deflating this into the bit and be able to find and prepare that and then resume. If the, you wake up in the morning and the walls are bulging in every direction a lot, then you know that the rubber ripped. And then this inner slice fit with some of this. And now the air feels a little bit less dense. And it's in, and in very basic barometric devices that can uh, show that. And you just set about identifying the rip and sealing it very easily without panicking. Because the double layer ensures that you can spend all the time in the world fixing that. Another feature that I love about this so not only does this, without any complicated parts, without any urgency, tell you about any amount of rippage, no matter how small or big, and which layer it came from, just by the nature of the gas that fills into the vacuum. You also have the benefit of saying, what if there's an asteroid impact up here? What if there's an earthquake? In one way or another, this fails, and this cracks, and uh, all this gives in. The butyl rubber I calculated in Martian gravity would under 15 pounds a square inch be able to hold this up while still showing a telltale vent in the ceiling to let you know that yeah indeed that loud thunk in the night did mess things up seriously and you need to set to work. Finally, these things are modular so that they're they're designed to fail locally and the crucial element of that as in this design of a ship with bulkheads is you need to be able to seal off one from another before the problem spreads. And I invented Another dimension of design here, it is again mechanism free, electronics free, sensors free sensors. What it is is a door which by protocol can be left open, unlike a bulkhead door, and you essentially secure that door to the wall so that it is hanging open by the slightest grip of a suction cup against the butyl rubber wall. That slight difference in air pressure inside that suction cup is going to cease to be effective the moment pressure drops inside here to a level that matters. So if the outer metal wall rips, it won't matter. If this really plunges, then the doors will shut themselves unless somebody was dumb enough to block them with an object. And we know that's what will happen because no system is truly foolproof. But the beauty of this is, what do you need to invent to be able to build all these sensors into this telltale system, just rubber, metal, a vacuum pump, um, be able to machine and move around the ceramic and rock materials that you already have, and air. And you have a system whose walls talk. And it's as intelligent as we need, and it couldn't be dumber. That's the Preston Tunnel. Cool. As smart as we need, and it couldn't be dumber. Mm. <laughs> I'm paranoid. Like, I've read enough sci fi, right? No, but that's like a title. That's <laughs> a title. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right. Number one, you need an architect. Because number two, <laughs> yeah. I need your butyl rubber on Mars for my next lecture. Really? All right. Yeah. In the loop, liquid with the squeezer so that we can do some seeing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. That's your next lecture. Yeah. I so who do we have? Just meet with me after. Please. I'm sure you do. We'll connect. Next. All right. Perfect. So I'll be sensitive to your time. Yes. Well, uh, I like it, but a lot of things you do in space, you won't do lower pressure. Not helping to do D, you're going to go to 10. 
sometimes all the way down to the DSI. Right. How is that going to affect your structure? I think that what you would need to do is basically account for that in terms of the thickness of the walls and also like how tall or wide you allow this space to be before it's going to collapse. Thankfully, Martian gravity cooperates. This wouldn't be nearly as elegant on Earth, but it's going to have a little more strength and a little bit more range on Mars. Yes? Would you mind going back to the far right side of the stars where you went from diaphragm to ether and then magic occurred? And <laughs> yes, let's do that. Absolutely. All right, and let's see if we can do that without it deciding to. Yeah? All right. Okay. I'm talking about the bottom. Now we get. All right, so we get our ether, we get our chloroethane, and it's a call of Wurtz reaction. And that uses sodium uh, and basically turns out in butane. You have a slightly longer polymer um, and uh, table salt and oxygen. And then the final step is again just simply called direct conversion of N-butane and this is one where I'm going to contact Nancy and we'll make sure that this is actually as self-explanatory as it sounds you know, to a chemist with the right resources available. But it does involve clearly no other reactant and so therefore definitely some sort of additional uh, input of energy. Um, I don't think you're just magically pulling energy out and then the hydrogen comes off and fractures. I think what you're doing is heating it and cooking out hydrogen. And what you get left is at least some portion, depending on the reaction selectivity, of isobutylene. And that's your basic component of that polymer. So you went from butane to butane to the polymer. And I think that it's, yeah, it is literally just going from butane to the polymer, to the polymer directly. And so I'd love to talk with you afterward and see if there is some missing step in the cracking and, you know, chain breaking process, because I know that a lot of people are petroleum engineers and playing with this stuff for ages, and this is really the crucial step when you're you're down to just carbon and hydrogen and trying to get it to, you, at that point, carbon and hydrogen will do a billion things for you, but you just need them to get in that right shape, right? And so if you would, afterward, I'd love to maybe get your info to make sure that we don't have any missing elements there. Yeah, so the, the, you know, some portion of that substance becomes isobutylene. Is it, is it a liquid? Once it transforms, yeah. in what way does it differentiate from the substance that we're doing? Well, I think that the isobutylene at this phase is liquid, and then there's actually a phase, a phase that actually involves extremely low temperatures, and that's one of the most expensive parts of the process of making it on Earth. And that's one of the beauties of it, the serendipities of it on Mars, is that we're just like, well, for this stage, we go outside the habitat, or we just turn off the heat in this, in this chamber of the you know, reaction area. Yes. Uh, I think it sounds really wonderful. I came to myself, so I really love this. Yeah. Uh, but uh, 10 centimeters sounds like a lot as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, do you have any kind of thoughts or information <coughs> about how you're going to get all that material? Because it sounds like quite a lot. Essentially, I do have an estimation of it, and it is just exactly that. It is quite a lot. And what I've what I've found is that we have an Apollo mission mentality about Mars colonization that simply can't endure scrutiny when we talk about living there autonomously. And so what we look at with this calculator is, I do know exactly how much we'll need, because I can figure out how many kilograms we'll need for a given volume, and then I can immediately like see, well, from there, if you plug that in, then the equations will cascade, and this will tell you what you need in terms of inputs. Now, one kilogram, you can imagine like maybe this big, is going to need two and a half kilograms of water, not too much. Um, some chlorine, what, 0.8 kilograms, so a good chunk, good fistful. Uh, sodium trioxide, 2.2 kilograms. Uh, sugar, five kilograms, so we're going to need some real agriculture happening at this time. And if you think that you can't afford to make a lot of sugar on Mars, then also I invite you to consider that maybe these people are going to starve to death or like the biosphere inhabitants go crazy. And some sodium, half kilogram, and two kilograms carbon dioxide, not in a significant amount. Um, that's, that's what we need. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Um, no, of course. If you want to talk about anything else uh, after, please come up and, and let me know. Yeah, we need to. It's 3.33, so we're three minutes in to the next gentleman's. What, you stole three minutes from me? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think I started at 3.03, so we're good. Thank you, guys.